Good afternoon, everyone. If there's been one theme to the Obama presidency thus far, it's the idea that together, that is, through the federal government, we can do great things. Obama may have run on hope and change, but he's governed on yes, we can. And by that, he means yes, the federal government can. In his retelling of the last 150 years of American history, the federal government is the great agent of change that brings us together and impels us forward. As he said in his second inaugural address, and I quote, together we determine that a modern economy requires railroads and highways to speed travel and commerce, schools and colleges to train our workers. Together we discovered that a free market only thrives when there are rules to ensure competition and fair play. Together, we resolved that a great nation must care for the vulnerable and protect its people from life's worst hazards and misfortune. Or again, in his most recent State of the Union address, at every moment of economic change throughout our history, this country has taken bold action to adapt to new circumstances and to make sure everyone gets a fair shot, we set up workers' protections, social security, Medicare and Medicaid to protect ourselves from the harshest adversity. We gave our citizens schools and colleges, infrastructure and the internet, tools they needed to go as far as their efforts would take them. This idea that we come together through government to do great things is not only a hallmark of Obama's worldview, it is one of the bedrock anchoring premises of modern progressive liberalism. The states and the localities, they can't be trusted. They're too provincial, too backwards, too religious, too racist. The private sector can't be trusted. That's where greed and selfishness run amok and corporations and one percenters fleece honest, hardworking Americans. But the federal government, that's who we can trust to take care of us, to rein in the excesses of capitalism, and to successfully carry out great enterprises. Now, liberals, of course, recognize that there are shortcomings, scandals, and the occasional abuse of power. I challenge you to find the Obama speech that doesn't include a call to cut waste and fraud from government. But these are viewed as anomalies, bugs in the progressive software, rather than permanent, inescapable features of centralized, sprawling government. Here comes Jay Cost with a fine new book entitled A Republic No More, Big Government and the Rise of American Political Corruption, in which Jay convincingly demonstrates that legal, institutionalized corruption is the inevitable result of a big government that is unmoored from the Constitution. For all the togetherness that Obama and his progressive brethren promise, what liberalism ends up delivering is not a republic, but rather a special interest democracy. What Koch shows by retelling in great detail the history of agricultural subsidies, pork barrel politics, the corporate tax code, Medicare, Freddie Mae, Fannie Mac, amongst others, is that government makes policy not with a view to the common good based on careful deliberation, but rather to please myriad special interests, groups who are looking for carve-outs and handouts. The Medicare chapter alone is worth the price of admission. It's an absolute must read that'll shatter any illusions you may have that these are rational, scientific, impartial uh, experts crafting these policies. I trust that many of you already know Jay and read his excellent work on a regular basis in the Weekly Standard. He is, I think, quite simply put, and this is not just my opinion, one of the smartest analysts of American politics around today. He brings to bear on the subject a rich knowledge of American history and American constitutional, con constitutionalism. Pardon me. He published his first book in 2012 entitled Spoiled Rotten, How the Politics of Patronage Corrupted the Once Noble Democratic Party and Now Threatens the American Republic. His work has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Post, National Review, National Affairs, Policy Review, and Fox News.
Please join me in welcoming Jay Costa. Well, thank you, David, for that very fine introduction. It's great to be here today. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And thank you so much uh, to the Heritage Foundation for sponsoring this talk. Um, books like this, I reckon, require a snappy or a peppy introduction. I want to sit here and bore you detailing my thesis step by step along the way. Instead, I think it's probably better to tell you the conclusion and then explain to you how I came up with it. But before I do that, I, I just want to sort of talk about the background of the book. This book, I sort of view it as kind of a, a cousin to Spoiled Rotten. Um, Spoiled Rotten was a history of the Democratic Party, and it gave me occasion to sort of make my way sail through the grimy backwaters of American political history, particularly in the 19th century, which is understudied, unfortunately. Um, and I, I just had noticed a lot of similarities between corruption as it was practiced in the 19th century and the way it's practiced today. And the similarities are not obvious. They're sort of structural or modal. Uh, and that's where I got the idea for this book is sort of write an institutional history of corruption, to isolate it as a phenomenon, think of it as bound up in the rules of the game, and try and trace its development over time. So now for my snappy, peppy introduction. Imagine that you are Indiana Jones, and you have been told on good authority that the Holy Grail is located somewhere deep in a cave. After much endeavoring, you get to the room you believe has the Grail only it's filled with cobwebs. Floor to ceiling and nothing else in sight. You get out your machete, because remember, you're Indiana Jones, so you have a machete on you, and you start hacking away. Confident that you can hack and slice and dice your way through this tangle of cobwebs to find the grail at the center of the room. You slice and you slice and you slice. In fact, you spend the remainder of your life cutting away at the cobwebs, but the only thing you ever find are more cobwebs. There's no holy grail, there's only cobwebs. We take our government to be a republic, and we have it on good authority. The Declaration of Independence, the preamble to the Constitution, the Federalist Papers, we have it on good authority that at the heart of our experiment in self-government is a commitment to the public interest. Sure, that commitment now, we tell ourselves, is firmly embedded within a vast ne ne nexus of interlocking client-patron pa relationships that connect members of Congress, interest groups, bureaucrats, and so on. But this, we say, is just the necessary cost of doing business. And when you peel back those layers, you find the magical center, the Republican heart of the American system. That is what I thought I would find when I began writing this book. The original title of the book was supposed to be The Violence of Faction, which is taken from James Madison's Federalist Number 10. But through the course of my research, I abandoned that title and elected what it is now called a republic no more. Instead, or because, as I argue in the conclusion and as David suggested, the best way to understand our government is not so much a republic, but rather a special interest democracy, an infinite tangle of interlocking client-patron relationships which corrupt the ideal, the republican ideal of self-government. Everybody is able to participate in our system, and in many instances, Politicians that we elect try or endeavor to accomplish projects on behalf of the public interest. But our system's defining methodology today, even when it is pursuing high tone goals, is this, granting favors to those who ask for them. We, we can call this many things. James Madison called it factionalism. Writing in the late 1960s, Ted Lowy called it interest group liberalism. Liberals are wont to complain about corporate welfare, and today conservatives are outraged by cronyism. I think these are all different words to describe the same phenomenon, corruption, and not in the narrow legal sense of the word, which leaves far too much out of the story. Illegality is included in my understanding, but corruption, according to me, is broader. It is the use of public resources to reward private groups at the expense of the public good. I think that this is the defining principle of the modern legislative process. So what to do about it? You know, how to get the government to operate on behalf of the public interest? This was a problem that the framers of the Constitution were assessed with. And there were certain options that were simply not tenable to them. The first and most widely availed in Europe up to that point was the notion of mixed estates. Right? Empower a monarch, empower a nobility to temper the rule of the people. 
Hamilton was most amenable to this idea, and his proposal to the Constitutional Convention essentially created a monarch and a House of Lords, but this was a non-starter. How about education in virtue, civic religion, to give people an understanding of their self-interest rightly understood? Again, that was a non-starter. The religiosity of our new republic in the 1780s was homogenous by today's standards, but back then, when there were meaningful differences among Protestant sects, a national religion would have been impossible. And indeed, our Constitution explicitly forbids it. How about a small republic, a city-state where the people were similar in their views and dispositions? The Articles of Confederation came close to that closest to that ideal, and in the five or so years between the end of the revolution and the new constitution, it was a disaster. State harassed state, often to extreme degrees, and within state boundaries, even small states like Rhode Island, justice was often sacrificed to the whims of fleeting and ill-tempered majorities. So the solution they finally hit upon was not really novel. Montesquieu, for instance, had talked about separation of powers, but the framers were unique in emphasizing it to the exclusion of almost everything else, which is well-designed governing institutions. They believed that this is what could preserve a true republic, or in other words, to force government to use its resources and powers on behalf of the people at large rather than narrow slices. Now, this is not to say that other nations did not have good or at least defensible institutions in 1787. It is just that the founders decided to focus relentlessly on institutions under the belief that they could take human beings, selfish as they are, and with proper institutional design, channel those selfish impulses into something approaching the public interest. The solution, uh, we can appreciate what exactly they were up to when we juxtapose the preamble to the Constitution with the rest of the document, which is really kind of strange when you think about it. I mean, when we think of the Constitution, we, we think of the Bill of Rights, maybe we think of the preamble, but you know, most of the Constitution is spent with some pretty clunky technical matters of government, and yet it opens up with this. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common de defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and posterity, do ordain and establish the Constitution for the United States of America. What follows after this rhetorical flourish is a dry and technical articulation of the various institutions of government. They go straight from this over to bicameralism. It's, it's a very strange, it seems disjointed. It may seem disjointed, but in fact, it wasn't to them. The framers believed that to do all the great and noble things that the preamble delineates, they had to focus on the minutia of institutional design. And what happens when institutions are not designed properly? Again, the framers had a taste of that in the 1780s. Factions are constantly in struggle for one another with for an advantage. That's just the way human nature works. And a badly designed government leaves the body politic at their mercy. Per Madison, such factions are, quote, united and actuated by common impulse of passion or interest adverse to the rights of other citizens or the permanent and aggregate interest of the community. And if governing institutions are badly built, their inevitable fight will destroy the Republican quality of any regime. He argues, looking, uh, surveying the political landscape in the 1780s, he argues, quote, complaints are everywhere heard from our most considerate and virtuous citizens, equally the friends of public and private faith and of public and personal liberty, that our governments are too unstable, that the public good is disregarded in the conflicts of rival parties, and that measures are too often decided not according to the rules of justice and rights of the minor party, but by the superior force of an interested and overbearing majority. However anxiously we may wish that these complaints had no foundation, the evidence of known facts will not permit us to deny that they are in some degree true. So in other words, Government was a real problem in 1787. I mean, the Constitution did not form out of a vacuum. It formed because of a crisis. What to do with these factions that were running rampant across the, the land? Madison was not interested in suppressing them. He thought that was impossible. Instead, he thought that good institutions could channel that conflict in socially beneficial directions. Ambition shall be made to counteract ambition, and the public good shall be preserved. And what do good institutions entail? Well, again, following Madison, they basically require creating artific artificial distinctions in government, akin to what the British had done, quote unquote, naturally with their mixed estates. Madison kept the idea of distinctions while ditching the nobility. 
All power in our system flows from the people in our regime, but it flows in different ways to different institutions in different intervals to facilitate what Madison hoped would be a grand clash of interests. And this requires implicitly something very important, that each institution of the government be crafted to handle responsibly the powers it has been granted. That means institutional design must match institutional power. No branch can be out of its depth. The two must be in sync. Institutional design has to be blended properly with power. And that was a blend as produced in 1787. Now, Madison wanted a national government of essentially limitless authority bound only weakly to, national, to local interests. His idea was that the leaders, leaders would be empowered to tackle pressing national problems while only worrying occasionally about the demands of the folks back home. Meanwhile, his opponents, who ultimately rallied to Roger Sherman's New Jersey plan, would keep the folks back home almost entirely in charge. Only a little bit of power would be centralized within the Continental Congress, a power to tax, for instance, but the design of the in co Congress would remain basically the same. One representative from each state, ensuring that parochial considerations were basically insuperable. And the Constitution occupied a middle ground on both these questions. It expands power less than what Madison wanted, but more than what Patterson wanted. It nationalizes institutions, as Madison wanted, but it still retains a decisively local flavor, which is Patterson's preference. And within these broad parameters, it delineated a logically defensive, defensible instrument of government, whereby institutions can wield their powers responsibly, and the ultimate Madisonian goal, interest counting acting interest for the public good, seemed achievable. And it was remarkable. It was a remarkable compromise for the America of 1787. This was a people dispersed and divided. There were no airplanes, there were no trains, there was no interstate highway system. It was easier to travel by boat to London than by land to Charleston if you lived in Boston. This is a people fearful, skeptical of centralized power, and worried about creeping monarchi monarchism. Yet they were in desperate need of a central authority that could deal with the pressing problems of the day. It was, for 1787, the Goldilocks solution. Not too little, not too much, just right. Now, over the ensuing two centuries and more, the American population grew from 4 million to about more than 300 million, and society changed, straining the original compromise and gradually forcing an effective revision of the governing charter. New problems emerged, problems that the men in Philadelphia didn't envision, and repeatedly the public decided that the power of the federal government had to grow to deal with new threats. And grow it did. And it grew and it grew. So much so that today, Washington, D.C. has achieved the scope of central government authority Madison envisioned in his original bid at the convention. The Virginia plan, which claimed authority to legis legislate in all cases where the states were deemed incompetent and the harmony of the union was at stake. For all intents and purposes, well, that's exactly what Washington, D.C. can do now. It can govern as it sees fit. Occasionally, the Supreme Court will strike it down at the margins, but by and large, Washington is supremely powerful. Yet the country never substantially revised the institutions of government that channel those ever-expanding powers. We have tinkered at the margins. We tweaked the Electoral College. We mandated the direct election of senators. We, of course, expanded the franchise. Still, for all of the growth in federal authority, the basic institutions remain largely as they were when the Constitution went into effect in 1789. And you can appreciate this if you think about the debates about what the various clauses in the Constitution mean. Liberals say that the necessary and proper clause means one thing. Conservatives say that it means something entirely different. But nobody debates that the Constitution mandates two senators and only two senators from every state. If California were to send five senators arguing that the Constitution be read more ambiguously, uh, three of them would be sent home. Now, from a Madisonian perspective, this is an enormous problem. If our institutions require a particular design in order to break and control the violence of faction, which is how he put it, and serve the common good, then it is imprudent to give greatly expanded power to institutions originally designed to do much less. But that is exactly what we have done. And we have done it in a decidedly ad hoc manner, even if the trajectory in government authority is always evermore. 
Crisis arises, voters elect a governing class that expands power haphazardly to deal with the challenge, and the expansion is retained even when or if the crisis passes. This lackadaisical process has left us with institutions that are far too tied to local or parochial interests and factions to permit the wise exercise of such sweeping national authority. Perhaps unsurprisingly then, at least I think it's unsurprising, our 18th century institutions wield 21st century power irresponsibly. They lack ad adequate checks and balances for these powers, and therefore they regularly tilt public policy to benefit narrow interests. Now, this, I think, points to the problem with big government as it relates to corruption. If we want government to do anything responsibly, anything at all, we have to be thoughtful in assigning powers to our institutions. We have to consider whether or not, as designed, they can handle them responsibly, whether or not they will indeed check and balance one another, whether or not it, ambition will be made to counteract the ambition. This we have failed to do, and that is how I see our current situation. And I take this to be a kind of unifying theme in American political corruption. As I noted at the top of my remarks, this book is sort of a, a relative of spoiled rotten. And this kind of pattern of corruption I see played out again and again. Uh, the idea that the existing institutions of government cannot ex exercise such new expansive powers responsibly, that it therefore exercises them irresponsibly, and in particular uses them to favor privileged groups. This theory connects a vast array of divergent and seemingly unrelated practices. So for instance, in the 1880s, the graft in the Treasury Department or log rolls in Congress over rivers and harbors have a lot to do with these new expansive powers. It helps, this theory helps explain the bank war of the 1830. It accounts for the patronage regime that gripped politics in the mid 19th century. In the Gilded Age after the Civil War, it was the growth of government primarily the growth of government that facilitated the rise of massive political sh machines in states like New York and Pennsylvania. The typical liberal story is that we had no government in the 19th century before Woodrow Wilson came along. Everything was the Wild West. But that wasn't actually true. The government was remarkably powerful. It had the power to create winners and losers through the tax law, through tariffs. And the winners that it created were machines in states like New York and Pennsylvania. And all of this, the government had acquired all sorts of tools to, to develop the national economy, and it misused them. And it misused them because they were never designed to use them properly in the first place. And so a handful of po politicians like Matthew Quay of Pennsylvania, and Tom Platt of New York, and above all, Nelson Aldrich of Rhode Island, and in case you're wondering, the person at the top of the book is actually Nelson Aldrich, they were able to centralize power around themselves, linking state and federal politicians to work on behalf of the trusts, often at the expense of poor farmers in the South and West. This theory, my theory about corruption, also explains a lot of the New Deal. It accounts for why the National Industrial Recovery Act was such a disaster. FDR was confident, supremely confident, as he was in all things, that he could bring labor, big business, consumer groups, and small business together in a grand bargain. And then he insisted, and he was so confident of this, he insisted on a law that was basically half-baked. And the NRA was quickly captured by big business, who in turn used it to their own advantage. Labor got nothing. Small businesses were rooked. And if you read the facts of the Schechter poultry case that brought down the NRA, it's actually appalling what the government was intending to do to the poor Schechter brothers. And the economy stagnated. It didn't do anything. And something similar happened with the Agricultural Adjustment Act passed the same year. Again, it was captured, not by big business, but by the plantation gentry of the South, who pocketed the free government cash. They kicked primarily black sharecroppers off their land, sent them flooding into the cities, and created the, uh, contributed to the urban crisis of the 1960s. And today, it explains why we are overwhelmed by the might of interest groups. You know, every time I'm in Washington, D.C., it's always amazing. I love walking through. I don't live here. I live in a small town in, in western Pennsylvania where we, we're too busy clinging to our, to, to our guns and to God to worry much about interest groups. But I'm always amazed driving around and seeing all the buildings and the interest groups. And, you know, it's, it's remarkable because 80 years ago, this was all mostly just farmland. And we're overwhelmed. Our government is overwhelmed by interest groups. You know, our government, 
can do basically whatever it wants. And that inverts the constitutional principle of enumerated powers, and it facilitates corruption. And how specifically does it do it in the modern age? Uncle Sam parcels out resources and even policy-making power to the organized factions that now surround Washington. And factions, again, I hasten to add, they weren't here 80 years ago. In return, governmental agents, particularly members of Congress, receive benefits in the form of campaign contributions, information, statements of public support, cushy post government jobs, and on and on it goes. In my book, I, as David noted, I look at farm subsidies, I look at the pork barrel, Medicare, taxes, and financial regulation, and I found the same phenomenon again and again and again. Interest groups dominate the policy-making process, regularly at the expense of the public interest, at a cost that my back-of-the-envelope calculation, by the time I got to Chapter 13, I was up a, around $100 billion a year. Now, is this proliferation of interest groups a good thing? Some people, pluralist theorists, would argue yes, and they would draw on ideas reminiscent of Madison, particularly in Federalist 10. Per this theory, no one group is able to dominate any other, so the end result must be policy that doesn't harm you know, the public interest. Just as you know, Madison seeks to pit faction against faction to secure the public good, we can be confident with that when the Chamber of Commerce squares off against the AFL-CIO, the two will balance one another out so that the final product of public policy is good for everybody. But this is a fallacy of composition. And just because all of the organized interests at the table have signed off on a proposal doesn't mean that it serves the public good. In fact, it often is the case that the process of policy development is far too favorable, favorable to certain groups over others. In such instances, the give and take among interest groups favor the wealthy over the poor, the organized over the unorganized, the active over the latent, and none of this has to be consistent with the public good. And similarly, what is to stop the various interests in the pluralist system from coordinating a massive log roll, such that each group is bought off by a particular benefit? Far from advancing it, this could be more detrimental to the public interest than if a single group dominated the body politic. And I found log rolls like that. I mean, not in the typical, not in the narrow sense of the word, actually political coalitions on the floor of the House of Representatives, but I found something akin to log rolls again and again in my study uh, through uh, American history public policy. The tariff regime of the 19th century was basically a log roll. You know, uh, the, the first federal minimum wage was basically a log roll, and today we have, we basically have uh, log rolls in federal housing policy and agriculture policy and Medicare and, of course, the pork barrel as well. Madison never intended any of this. In fact, he envisioned a polity that worked in exactly the opposite manner. In the Federalist Papers, he was justifying an 18th century in government of discrete and limited powers by arguing that properly designed, it could successfully play referee among the various forces in society. What we have today is a universe dominated by something much worse. In a letter to Jefferson during the height of the fight over the First Bank of the United States, Madison fretted about the effects of this new institution. He wrote, the stock jobbers will become the Praetorian band of the government, at once its tool and its tyrant, bribed by its largesses and overawing it by clamors and combinations. We are now overrun by Praetorian bands, plural. That is, groups created by, personally interested in, and seeking everywhere to manipulate public policy to their own ends. These groups are not balanced by our system because our system was never meant to balance them. Instead, it stimulates them to become aggrandizing clients whose violence, quote unquote, Madison feared would destroy the republic. In return, to the metaphor I used at the top, that the idea of an endless tangle of interest groups, lobbyists, members of Congress and bureaucrats, you peer down through it and you find nothing but more tangle. These are not the deals that ultimately facilitate responsible public policy, the messy but necessary transactions to produce legislation ultimately in the public interest. In some interests, in some instances, of course, I wouldn't disagree that the public, public good may be facilitated, sure, but too often in extremely, grossly inefficient ways, and too often beyond that in ways that undermine the actual initial point of the legislation in the first place. My contention, again, is that this inevitably, 
traces back to our in governing institutions. They were simply not designed to handle such authority responsibly. And that is why we, what we have are malfunctioning agents of government. They are simply asked to do too much. And that's why I titled the book the way I did, A Republic No More. Madison believed that good institutions were essential to maintaining the Republican quality of a government. But subsequent generations have ignored, in my opinion, have ignored his wise counsel, wrongly believing that these institutions, as left to us in the Constitution, could handle the responsibilities of 2015. They can't. And rapid, rampant corruption is a consequence of their incompetence. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm going to let Jay field questions himself sure. from the audience, but I'd like to pose the first one. Uh, in spite of the 300 pages of well-documented rampant corruption, <laughs> the book doesn't end on a note of complete despair. I found the ending to be very interesting in which you suggest that there are actual possibilities for bipartisan agreement on some reforms. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, well, I don't think it would be easy. Um, and I certainly wouldn't predict that it would, would happen, so I don't want to come across as naive in light of the polarization in party politics. But at the end of the book, I, I argue that there's three types of citizens. There are the uninterested, people who pay no attention to politics. There are the interested, people who pay attention to politics because they are deriving some sort of benefit from it in some way, some personal benefit, or alternatively, they fear that their personal benefit might be taken away. And finally, there are the disinterested. These are people who pay attention to politics not because, you know, they're looking for some tax loophole written for them or some form of corporate welfare, or they're looking to get a higher farm subsidy. These are people who pay attention to politics because they care about the country at large, public-spirited citizens. And the left and the right have, on both sides, public-spirited citizens. The base of both parties is at least partially made up of public-spirited citizens. And there are, I believe, areas where the left and the right, the public-spirited citizens of both the left and the right, can find areas of, of uh, agreement. And broadly defined, I would, I would characterize it in this way, that, you know, Herbert Crawley's promise of American life, you know, basically what he wanted to do, as it was said, he wanted to use Hamiltonian means for Jeffersonian ends, which, was, which is to say he wanted to use an expansive understanding of governmental power to generate greater equality. Well, we could, a potential political compromise that would unite the left and the right against corruption, we, you might call it Jeffersonian means for Jeffersonian ends, cutting the power and scope and largesse of the federal government in ways that uh, benefit the most powerful, well-connected factions here in Washington. The challenge, though, and this is part of the problem, is that uh, you know, it is said often that uh, the ideologies, the left and the right, have captured the American political parties. The left is now um, democratic, or the Democratic Party is now is now liberal, and and the Republican Party is now conservative. And this is true. But the problem is that the parties have captured the ideologies as well, right? So conservatives are now Republican, and liberals are now Democratic, and I. And I think you can see this if you read conservative media and then go over and read liberal media. It's very interesting that they complain. Both sides complain about the corrupt practices on the other side and generally tend to ignore or excuse the corrupt practices on their own side. And so that that is going to be the real challenge there is getting, you know, coordination that basically runs contrary to the cut of, uh, of the American party regime would not be would not be easy but it's it, you know liberals don't want huge subsidies to Monsanto right because Monsanto's a big you know multi billion whatever Mon Mon Monsanto's enormous conservatives don't want it either because conservatives don't think government should be spending money on things like that period so it seems to me that there's a potential area of agreement at least potentially whether or not it'll actually happen remains to be seen probably not I just, uh, one of the points I have is that it seems like there was a sea change in American history when it comes to the legislative power and the development of the administrative state. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could comment on this. 
And that's the question of legislative delegation. Uh, the Export-Import Bank fight is going up right now. But that's actually a, a quasi-governmental, yep. you know, it's, it's a company that has essentially legislative powers that have been delegated to it. And this is all throughout that system. And that seems to be part of the problem, is that Congress doesn't, isn't responsible for so many of the policies that are made. So I was just wondering if you could comment on the way that the delegation of legislative authority in the 20th century especially created a sea change within the administrative state. Like how, how much of an impact do you see that actually having made? That's a great question. I think it's had enormous impact. Um, and I think it, I don't deal with that specifically in the book, but I, but if I were to try and account for it from the frame of my book, it would be the following. The Congress as originally designed was never, never, we're talking about the Export-Import Bank, right? This is an authority. And of course, the Constitution, Article 1, Section 1 opens up that all legislative authority shall be vested in a Congress of the United States of America, right? And composed of the House and the Senate. So all power flows through Congress, and you see that, you see it in the geography of Washington, D.C. Right, we focus so relentlessly on the presidential election, and oh, did you hear Scott Walker's up in Iowa and Quinnipiac today? Woo! Right? But that's not really how the framers saw our government functioning, and that's not really how it functions in practice. That might be how, what we look at, but in practice, power flows through Congress. And so the problem that we have now, right, it gets to this idea. Congress is institutionally not capable of creating and managing a program like the Export-Import Bank responsibly. It is too parochial. It is too divided against itself. It just can't do it. So what does it do? It sends it off to the executive branch. This is a typical strategy that Congress has employed over the years. If basically Congress decides we are going to tie our own hands and we are just going to send the power off to the federal government. I mean, it's one reason why the Republicans are hamstrung on this immigration fight, because the way funding works for INS is big. Congress isn't in charge of its funding. Congress gave that power up because it decided it couldn't handle it responsibly. That c contributed, by the way, as well to the financial crisis of 2008, right? The Office of Tri uh, 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 Thrift Supervision uh, didn't get its funding through Congress because Congress didn't think that they could they could responsibly fund an entity like that. So it gave them the power to fund itself via the fees it collects from, institu from financial institutions that register as thrifts. And OTS went around and trolled around for, for, you know, dangerous outlets like Washington Mutual and Countrywide. This is a common problem, that Congress is often aware of its, in, its own incompetence, and it sends power off to the legislative branch. And a, another one, how about, how about the BRAC Commission, military base closures? I mean, this is something that co Congress basically doesn't get a say in it at all. By its, own, by its own judgment, because Congress couldn't do it, and it had so, by the end of the 1980s, it was so embarrassed at its own incompetence that it just handed it off to the executive branch. But that in and of itself creates powers. I mean, it, it, it challenges, does it not, this, the, the democratic foundation of our system, that you know, Congress is this institution that is most responsive to the public, and the unelected bureaucrats in our system are the least responsive, and yet power is systematically transferred to the latter. Yes. Uh, my name is Hermes. Uh, I wanted to have your uh, comment or opinion about uh, the founding fathers, especially Madison, and some of them tried to communicate to us something, uh, which is the reason why one of them put at the Library of Congress a certain book. We are living now in a time where maybe what they were trying to communicate to us is happening. You choose to talk about corruption and the government becoming much more powerful. Uh, all the problem that is happening now, what do you think, uh, besides the corruption, would be the most dangerous or the most uh, pernicious effect we should be paid attention, paid attention to? Um, I think that it, uh, I, closely related to the issue of corruption, right, if it gets back to institutional incompetence, 
right? If it gets back to this idea that our government was not, I mean, put aside, like take an issue like Medicare, okay? And put aside the legal questions about whether or not uh, Congress has the authority to create a program like Medicare. Just think of it from a prac, think of it from a philosophical standpoint, think of it from a civic standpoint. You know, this was not a program that they envisioned. How could they have? Modern medicine didn't even exist yet. The the you know the app GDP per capita in 1787 was something like fifteen hundred dollars a person. I mean that's a that's an accounting error in 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 a single Medicare claim. You know oh so well we were off by five thousand on that. Whoops you know um, it was just something that was not envisioned and 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 so our institutions are just not capable of exercising the powers, powers responsibly. I argue that creates corruption. I also think. And you see it in the case of Medicare, is that our institutions are not able to exercise these powers responsibly, and so what often happens is they do nothing, and they do nothing in the face of an impending crisis, and and, a, and an impending crisis in in the case of Medicare and our and our welfare state, that you know, 50 years ago, commitments were made that simply cannot be maintained, and something has to be done about it, and Congress is not going to do anything about it. I believe. That's my personal prediction. I don't think Congress is going to do anything until it is absolutely positively forced to do, do something. And even then, it will mostly just pretend like it did something and do nothing at all. So that's another problem. And another problem beyond corruption, beyond, you know, when I'm talking about corruption, a lot of this stuff is pretty quotidian. You know, I mean, the Farm Bill, for instance. I mean, talk about dull and boring and, you know, nobody wants to talk about the Farm Bill. But this is what the sort of stuff Congress does, or pork barrel. It's pretty quotidian. Or renewing various corporate expenditures in the tax code, right? All real stuff that, like, you know, if you click around enough pages on the hill.com, you'll find a story about it. But that's about it. You know, but the other thing that it happens, and people complain about this all the time. They complain about gridlock. It's like, well, okay, the government is gridlocked. Little wonder that a government in 1780, designed in 1787, basically the same, can't, can't, you know, function responsibly in 2015. And then it just, gridlock is just when the government elects to do nothing. And that's, I think, another consequence of this institutional, um, you know, incompetence. Uh, yeah. I had a completely separate question, but you bring up an interesting point. Do you or do you not feel that institutional gridlock was sort of the point or part of the point? Oh, it absolutely was. Absolutely, institutional gridlock is supposed is is built into the system, and it is a, and in is in many respects a good thing. Um, you know, and that gets back to you know Madison and Federalist Ten, right? If you're going to have a grand clash of interests, then you know they're only gonna nobody's first offer is ever going to be accepted. Right, because it's going to be countered by somebody else, and there's going to be disagreement, and they're going to have to fight. And the Senate and the House and the President are all going to have to agree, um, and and that's going to take a while because they're all they all have different linkages back to the people. Right? Um, absolutely, gridlock is not necessarily a bad thing. I think gridlock, and I actually now prefer gridlock because I think our government is so fundamentally dysfunctional that that if it can't do anything then that's okay by me um, but again it, you know there's there's gridlock like that and then there's gridlock to the effect of like well you know look in a generation you know Medicare is going to bankrupt us so we should maybe do something about that now you know gridlock in the in the in this in a case where you know, everybody agrees that there's a problem. Everybody agrees on the contours of the solution. And, and everybody has to. I mean, you know, the reality is we can't tax our way out of this because medical inflation is going to grow at such a rate it's going to exceed, you know, any kind of growth in tax income. So we're going to have to cut. We're going to have to cut benefits. That's what we have to do. And it's going to be painful, and it's going to be uncomfortable, but we have to do it. And that, and see, this is part of the problem that we have, right, where gridlock becomes, you know, a malady, which is that Congress doesn't like to cut. Congress doesn't want, co you know, members of Congress, even on the Republican side, they view their job primarily, even if they don't say it this way, implicit in what they do every day is they, they like to play, they like to give, grant, extend, expand, amplify. You know, that is what they do. That is how they use the powers that they have. And in the case of Medicare, the opposite is called for. And so they elect instead to do nothing. In fact, they do more than that. I mean, they create this entire fiction. For instance, the doc fix is, is a fiction. Right? And there's all sorts of other fictions. I mean, Obamacare's a treatment of Medicare is, is just completely 
it, it's a political mythology. None of it will happen. But it's on the federal books. And then therefore, when the CBO makes an estimate about what's going to happen, CBO is bound by the law to estimate that this is, this, this is going to happen. So it looks less bad than it will actually be. And then later on in the CBO reports or in the CMS actuary reports at the very end where Congress is sure nobody except, you know, me and a handful of other people are reading, that's when they tell you what's really going to happen and that's how it's going to be a real disaster. I and mean, that's the other thing they do is that they lie systematically about, you know, it's a good thing, for instance, that Congress doesn't have to submit its books to the Securities and Exchange Commission. That would be very, very unfortunate for them. No, Laura in the back. Sorry, there's a blind yeah. spot there. Uh, I could still concentrate very well. Um, a question about um, campaign financing. Um, if this is driven by money and special interests, a lot of people say that it starts there. So what's your thinking on that, and what changes, if any, do you think should be made? Well, that's a dangerous question for me here at the Heritage Foundation because I tend to have heterodox views on uh, campaign finance. Um, I think that, first of all, our entire campaign finance regime is built and premised upon political deception. Uh, there is a, a campaign, at the heart of campaign finance law is, is a lie. And the lie is that this, this legislation exists as it is, was written originally to keep corrupting money out of politics, when in fact the opposite is true. Right? We have the campaign finance regime that we have now because in the, in the 1940s, organized labor found a workaround, the Smith-Connolly Act, which forbid, forbade direct labor union contributions to political candidates and subjected labor to the same strictures that existed in the Tillman Act of 1907, which forbid uh, business from giving directly to political candidates. Labor solution to that and the Congress of Industrial Organization solution to that was the CIO PAC, which was created, I believe, in 19, it was, it was active in the 1944 election. That was their workaround, right? In the 1960s, a federal judge said, that's illegal and you're going to go to jail to a handful of labor union political guys. And so labor appealed and pressed upon their, um, their friends in Congress to legalize political action committees, and they did so in the Federal Elections Campaign Act. This history has been mostly forgotten, even by people who know a lot about, not, not conservatives, but if you talk to your average Beltway journalist who knows a lot about campaign finance law, they'll say, oh, well, we have this because Watergate was such a disaster and we had to clean the money out of politics. That's not true. We have what we have because labor was getting squeezed and they had friends in Congress and Nixon being Nixon signed it into law. Uh, and what happened is, is that by legalizing PACs, see, businesses had been very hesitant to start political action committees. Um, and what happened was that they, they, they just, it was Annie bar the door. They just came crashing through. And it's sort of ironic, and for those of you like myself who are not big fans of organized labor, it's sort of a, you know, a little schadenfreude there because labor got totally overwhelmed within the, within the decade. And what it did, see, this is, this is the problem with campaign finance, right, as it exists now, right? The, the limits on campaign giving, $1,000 for an individual per cycle and $5,000 per political action committee. You know, members of Congress will say, oh, well, this, this really keeps the money out of, this really does it. But what it actually does is protects members of Congress. Because if you are a candidate for office, a challenger, you know, it is, really, really, really hard to raise a million dollars at a thousand bucks a clip. I mean, you basically have to find a thousand people to chip in a thousand bucks, right? But if you're a member of Congress and you are on the subcommittee of something, something nobody ever heard of, but these handful of interests are in, in you know, they, they have a financial stake in the business before you. Uh, and even if you're a backbencher, it's no problem. You can raise that money in a week if you're sufficiently motivated. 
Uh, and the really good ones, they raise so much money that they and they spread it around and develop, you know, uh, leadership uh, leadership packs to 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 grow professionally in Congress. The whole thing is designed that way. In other words, the whole thing is designed to protect incumbent members of Congress and to facilitate the money, the transfer of resources from interest groups to campaign uh, campaign coffers, and then a lot of times it gets shunted back around to the pockets of a member of Congress. So I'm a congressman. Let's say I'm a congressman, and I'm running for re-election, and you know, I need a really good campaign manager, somebody who understands what I need and the people I know, I'll hire my wife and she will draw a salary of $50,000, nothing unreasonable, but my campaign will pay her. I mean, that is completely legal. And it's also, you know, if Tony Soprano were doing something like that, it would be called money laundering is what it is. So the question then becomes, what do we do? Well, I, you know, for starters, I'm a huge fan of Citizens United. Um, and I think the left is absolutely wrong about Citizens United because a handful of public spirited billionaires who are not involved in politics because they're interested, but because they're disinterested, can, could swap this system by cutting just a handful of checks. So that's one thing I really like. Beyond that, I just question the premise and the validity. I don't see why political action committees, which were created in the 1940s for purely political purposes and vindicated in the 1970s, legalized for purely political purposes. I don't know why they're so gosh darn essential to free speech. I don't understand that. I, if I had my druthers, I'd get rid of them altogether. Beyond that, I think that another thing that should be considered is maybe imposing some serious, realistic conflict of interest laws upon the Congress. If I was a federal judge and you are a you know, Fortune 500 company and you have business before my court and you write me a $10,000 check and I pocket it and it comes out that I did that, I'm going to be in a lot of trouble. I'm going to be in a lot of trouble and you're going to be a lot in a lot of trouble. But if I am the subcommittee chairman of some, you know, uh, some committee you've never heard of and you write me a $10,000 check, uh, you know, that's no problem. In fact, that's just the way things are done. And I don't, I don't see why, for instance, you know, members of Congress should be allowed to accept money from, uh, interest groups with business before the committees that they're members of. I don't see why that is so essential either. That strikes me as a conflict of interest. So that would be another thing that I would do. You know, beyond that, you know, there's other things you could do as well. You know, you could, you know, tighten up the revolving door. Glenn Reynolds of Instapundit has a great idea called a revolving door surtax where 60 to 70 percent of the difference between your government salary and your post-government salary gets collected uh, in a tax. I think that's a great idea, too. So there's all sorts of fun things you could do. The problem is, right, see, the problem is Congress doesn't want to do any of this. And this is the real challenge, and this is why, you know, when, I was, when David asked me what do we do about this, and I was very pessimistic, you know, look, Congress is only going to do something. We're basically asking Congress to reform itself. Congress does not want to reform itself. The rules of the game in Congress work very, very, very well for members of Congress. They don't want to fix them. The only thing that is going to induce them to change is sustained outside pressure, whereby they come to believe that they will lose their jobs unless they change the rules of the game. That's the only thing that will do it. It's the only thing. You can't just propose a bill and expect it to get a vote on eliminating political action committees. They will never, it will never go anywhere. They love them. They're integral to the way they do business now. I do, I'm Dean O'Drudy, an interested citizen. I do kind of like your, your general philosophy, but I, I see between the lines that you're saying two things, and I'd like you to confirm or refute that I perceive that properly, and if you'd like, comment on them. Sure. The first thing that you're saying is... That, con that is that the legislative branch of government, which is closest to the people, is, to is not only dysfunctional, but increasingly over time dysfunctional. Right. And that as a consequence, the other two branches effectively have to fill the, va the political, because you can't have a vacuum in politics. So what you get out of that is an activist judiciary, 
and uh, ab abusive power writ large by the executive. Now, there's nothing new with abusive power. Lincoln did it all the, in matter of course. And the latter tends toward dictatorship. So that leads to the second thing that I think that you're implying, which is that the system is perhaps by design and certain more likely or, or certainly by the way it has evolved, dysfunctional and therefore needs to be comp effectively scrapped or major modified via constitutional convention? Um, well, in answer to your first question, uh, you know, do other branches fill the, fill the vacuum in the, in the space that's left by a Congress that is incapable or uninterested in governing on behalf of the public good? I would say that um, to some degree, the answer is yes. Um, I, I do agree with that. However, I also think that a lot of times it's just posturing, particularly by the chief executive, to give the false impression that he is in charge when, in fact, nobody is in charge. So I, I, it, would, it depends on a case-by-case -case basis. Now, in, in response to your second sort of question about, well, what do we do about this in our in, major institutional designs necessary? Well, look, I mean, I, I think I don't think that's practical on a political level. It's never happened. I doubt very much it it will happen. I sort of, you know, I, I, when I when I wrote the book, uh, when the book came out, I, I had a companion piece in the in the um, Weekly Standard, and I have a longer piece coming out in National Affairs that's sort of like, what do we do about this? And my preferred approach is more of a transaction cost approach, which is to say that I don't believe that there is really anything structural that's in the offing. It's feasible. So that the best, the next best approach is to just make life more difficult for these sorts of transactions, increase the transaction cost to this, uh, you know, process of giving and granting favors uh, that exists in Washington D.C. So things like the revolving door and campaign finance reform, smaller ball stuff. In the conclusion, I, I distinguish between a, Ma a Madisonian moment where you rebalance the scales. On the one hand, and on the other hand, I call it a mugwump moment, right? And the mugwumps were this reform coalition that sprung up about 20 years after the Civil War ended, a little less, that were just outraged by the patronage regime and how it had corrupted the republic, and they wanted civil service reform. And it was a bipartisan effort. There were Republicans and Democrats involved in the mugwump movement. And that is something that I think is more feasible, uh, and I think that was probably a better use of our resources to fight corruption is to is not to solve it once and for all, but maybe m modest tweaks to harass the people who are engaged in these sorts of this pay-to-play activity. Alden had his hand up several times, and, oh. and then we'll do the last question with no, Matt. I, I think you've already answered it, Dave. The question about uh, potential Article 5 uh, convention, just to consider possible limited amendments, uh, done through, at, through states call, you think that that's totally impractical. I think you've already answered that. Yeah, I, I do. And I think that, you know, look, I, I think that in a lot of respects, you know, in 1787 there was a divide. Like there was a dis divide between people who wanted, you know, an expansive federal authority and, there, and between people who wanted limited federal authority. And, you know, that divide has evolved over the years, but it's also it also exists today. So I just don't have a lot of confidence in the in the supermajority requirements of any kind of amending process, and you know through the typical channels and an Article Five convention, that that just seems to me to be a recipe for chaos. So Matt, you get to ask the last question. Right. Uh, well, thanks, Jay. Thanks for an excellent book and uh, you know great thought-provoking um, uh, thesis here. I, I wanted to challenge one of your last statements and then suggest sure. an alternative. So mm -hmm. um, you suggest uh, that there ought to be you know, serious conflict of interest limits that committee members should, shouldn't be allowed to accept campaign donations from uh, businesses that have business before them. Mm -hmm. So uh, just playing this out a little bit, let's think about it. So it, I think it, I agree with you. There's a huge problem that government has the ability to hand out privileges to particular firms. 
or interest. This is you know my main focus. Yeah. But um, at this, but they don't just hand out rents. They also extract rent. They're mm -hmm. also in the business of extracting concessions Absolutely. from from businesses. And I do think it's vitally important that businesses be able to redress uh, those concerns and to peti petition their government. So imagine you know how this plays out. Okay, so you can't donate to a more moderate member of a, of a committee or a campaign of a moderate, more, more moderate member of a committee who doesn't want to extract rent. S uh, so now you have to donate to a friend of the, com of, mm. of the congressman. So now there's a new law that says you can't do that. Uh, so you, we, of course, have to close that down. You, you follow down this path pretty quickly, and you've sort of closed off all Everything. reasonable opportunities to redress uh, uh, your government. Mm -hmm. So I would suggest an alternative. Quid pro quo has to have both a quid and a pro quo. Mm -hmm. uh, so long as government has the ability to offer out quid, people are going to be offering pro quo. So uh, a better solution is to try to s try to limit congressmen's abilities to hand out privileges to particular groups, rather than to limit groups' abilities to ask Congress for favors. Well, I certainly agree with that, um, and I, you know. Well, I, I sort of, I take, in the book, I, I take a, a sort of a neutral posture on the, on the size of government. Uh, in theory, I'm opposed to large government, and I'm appalled by large government um, that has been retrofitted on top of a small constitution. So any way to, for instance, fight, um, you know, the capacity of Congress to, to, to give rents and to extract rents, I'm all in favor of. That is an interesting, I hadn't thought about that, so I appreciate that. I'm going to take that, that sort of the danger there of, of you know, you're, because you're absolutely right, is that it, you know, the extraction of favors doesn't only go one way. Congress can make a threat and then if, if essentially force um, a force a political interests to or business interests or private interests to pay them off to talk them down. It's it's a very common uh, and it it happened. You know, it was a very con it's actually that is one of the big reasons why we got those big political machines in the 19th century because businesses were tired of dealing with this endless horde of avaricious state legislators who just you know were basically extorting them every step along the way and you can't pay off you know every member, uh, you, you know, you're Standard Oil and you're all across the country, you can't pay off every Republican state legislator, but you could you could pay off Nelson Aldrich and you could pay off Matt Quay and Tom Platt and he would take care of his people. So, I mean, that is something, unfortunately, we don't, well, not unfortunately, but that is one thing we don't have anymore. And, uh, you know, businesses, of course, are left to fend for themselves against grasping avaricious legislators. And it's a very good point, too, and it's something I wouldn't want to, I don't want to sort of give the impression here, the false impression that, oh, poor members of Congress, they just they don't have a choice, you know. It's a two-way street, uh, and there are no angels, and there are no demons in my stories, but I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pocket your suggestion or your counsel about a conflict of interest legislation, and as I refine my ideas, I'm going to keep that in mind, so thank you very much. Well, there are copies of the book that are outside for sale, and I'm sure that Jay would be glad uh, to sign some. So please join me again in thanking Jay Costa. Thank you. Thank you.